without further ado, uh, I'll let Guy talk through his, his own introduction, but thanks guys for coming on the Sunday morning. Um, and hopefully you're not as hungover as I am. <laughs> hey guys, good morning. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Cool, uh, so I'll start. Um, my name is Guy, and I'm, I'm here to talk to you about, uh, present my talk, explaining, Exploiting Immune Defenses, Can Malware Learn from Biological Viruses? So I'll start a bit uh, introducing myself. Um, my name is Guy Proper, and I see the font here is kind of funny, but never mind. Um, it's, I, I had people ask me that throughout the conference. It's actually my real name. It's not an alias. Uh, and well, I find it funny, but none of you guys do, probably. <laughs> um, and uh, I've been a researcher for the past two years at a cybersecurity company called Deep Instinct. And before that, I did my bachelor's degree in biology and cognitive science in uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And right now, I live in Tel Aviv, which is a cool city, and that's why the photo is there. Um, actually, before I start, out of interest, uh, how many of you guys have a uh, biological background, a degree, or? OK, cool. I, cool. Um, okay, the agenda for today, I'll start with some uh, general background. Um, basically, general biological background that's necessary for the second part of the talk, uh, in which I'll talk about how viruses exploit uh, immune defenses. And in the third part, I'll conclude and compare a well-known virus, virus and a well-known malware, HIV-1 and DUKU-2, to see if they're similar in any way. So I'll start with the background. Um, what are biological viruses? Um, basically, biological viruses are um, structures that contain genetic material. It can be DNA or RNA, which is surrounded by a protective structure called the capsid. It's a protein, protein structure. Uh, what's unique about viruses is that they are defined as non-living, meaning uh, they cannot reproduce on their own. In order to reproduce, they must abuse um, the replication machinery of, of another living cell. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, so basically, in order to do that, what they have to do is uh, infect another cell, enter it, and then abuse the machinery that that cell uses for its own replication in order to reproduce themselves and continue spreading. Um, what you can see on, on the left is a virus that attacks bacteria. It's called a phage. And the picture there has the DNA, which is surrounded by, you see, the protective structure that uh, I, I talked about called the capsid. And on the right is an actual uh, electron microscope image. It's a real image of these phages around a bacterial cell preparing to uh, enter it. One more thing that's important to know about viruses is that they are very diverse. Um, Viruses attack pretty much every, every known organism. There are viruses that attack bacteria, uh, animals, of course, and also plants. Uh, the last bit of, of basic background I want to talk about is something called uh, the central dogma of biology. This is a very basic uh, idea in molecular, molecular biology, and it talks about the uh, transfer of information in biology. So basically, uh, all information in the cell is stored in, uh, in molecules called DNA. They contain the genetic code. And these molecules, the code contains all the instructions that the cell will perform during its lifetime. Uh, one important note is that uh, all living organisms have these small basic units called cells, uh, which make up their, their uh, bodies. And each of these cells contains uh, DNA. Uh, this DNA is then transcribed into an intermediary molecule called RNA, uh, which also stores the information. And then that RNA is translated into proteins. And proteins are uh, three-dimensional structures, and they actually perform the day-to-day uh, -day functions of the cell. So when you uh, breathe or eat or whatever else, uh, the proteins are what performs uh, the functions in your body. And the instructions for these proteins are contained uh, in the DNA. And when the viruses abuse the uh, replicative machinery of the cell, basically what they do is they do this process, uh, but they cannot, they don't have the, the uh, machinery that, that is needed to transcribe and translate, so they abuse uh, the proteins that the cell has in order to do that. Um, I also want to talk a bit about uh, defense mechanisms against viruses. So since viruses attack uh, all other types of organisms that we know of, uh, these organisms can also defend themselves from viral attacks. And uh, this is a really big topic, and I'll, I'll, I'll not go into detail here, but uh, all I want to say is that 
these defenses, there are two types of defenses, generic and targeted. Um, by generic defenses, I mean defenses that protect the organism from any kind of attack. Uh, it could be from viruses, bacteria, even from like, physical harm. Uh, and then there are targeted defenses, which protect the organism either against a specific type of threat, so uh, protect against all viruses, or even more targeted than that, uh, can protect against specific types of, of viruses. An example for that is uh, our adaptive immune system, uh, which learns throughout our lifetime to uh, recognize specific threats. And so uh, if we were attacked by a specific type of virus for the first time, it might not necessarily recognize it, but uh, this system has memory and it will recognize a second attack and respond much faster and much more effectively. Uh, now I want to move on to the second part of the talk. I'll give a brief overview of, a, of what we're going to cover. So uh, I want to start with uh, some key differences between viruses and malware, which I think are important for the next, next uh, points. And then I'll cover briefly the life cycle of viruses and then uh, methods of privilege escalation, persistence, and defense evasion in viruses. Okay, so um, two key differences between malware and viruses are intent and evolution. Uh, what I mean by intent is that when someone writes a piece of malware, they have, they have a specific cause for writing that. It could be stealing money or stealing information or uh, whatever else they want to do. Um, while viruses were not formed, they were formed by nature, uh, you, could, you could put it that way, but they weren't formed with a specific intent. Um, they weren't formed, for example, to cause a disease. Their only real purpose, um, even though there's no, not really a purpose in, in evolutionary biology, is to reproduce and survive. Um, so they don't, all the damage that they cause uh, f to achieve that purpose is not, is not intentional. It's just like a statistical byproduct of, of evolution. So the second difference is, is evolution. Uh, when malware, evo malware evolves, it's um, due to uh, the, the author of that malware wanting to either achieve new goals or to escape, uh, escape defenses. Even if there's a, a mutation engine in the malware, which is uh, random or semi-random, uh, that was also put intentionally there by, by the author. It wasn't, it wasn't formed by chance. While in biology, evolution is, is statistical and everything happens by chance, and if, if it succeeds, then it just keeps going and, and replicating. Um, now I want to show you, okay, I wasn't supposed to start yet. Never mind. I want to show you a short video of a viral infection. This is a phage attacking a bacterial cell. So it attaches itself to the cell and is preparing to inject its DNA. Once the DNA is injected, the virus abuses the replicative machinery of that cell, and lots of new viruses are formed. Eventually, they will want to exit the cell, and uh, they will kill the cell when, uh, when exiting it, and then they will infect all the cells nearby, while the bacterial population tries to defend itself. Uh, one important note, this is uh, not, not a real uh, video, it's just like um, an impression. Uh, I, I, I think this is uh, close to what happens in real life because uh, electron microscope images are close to this, but I don't think anyone has a video of an actual uh, viral infection to this resolution. Okay, uh, the life cycle of viruses is, uh, I guess, the same or similar to the life cycle of malware. It starts with creation of the virus. Uh, the viruses were created at some point by, by nature. Then there is infection where the virus attaches itself to a cell that it wishes to infect and abuse. Once the virus manages to infect the cell, it executes its code, which can do a bunch of things, but again, the only, the only real purpose of that code is to cause the virus to replicate and spread. And that leads to both a host response, because the host uh, wants to continue living, uh, and to evolution of both the virus and the host as they uh, continue to combat each other. Uh, now we'll go into a bit more detail about uh, privilege escalation, persistence, and defense evasion in viruses. Uh, I have, I'm not gonna cover like uh, in a lot of detail the similarities to, uh, to malware, but I have the examples uh, in the slides. Um, so in order to uh, replicate inside the cell, the virus has to enter it um, in two parts. The first part is entering the cell itself. You can see a picture of an animal cell that, there. It has uh, this wall around it called a membrane. And uh, well, the big yellow circle inside is the nucleus. 
and this is what contains the actual replicative machinery of the cell. Um, I call this privilege escalation because uh, not everything can enter the cell because its uh, entry and exit is mediated by, by a bunch of uh, components in the cell. Um, and I'll, I'll have a bit of a spoiler. In the second part, the virus has to enter the nucleus, which is even harder because, um, again, not, not everything can enter the nucleus. It's highly monitored. Um, so in order to, to replicate, the virus has to escalate privileges twice in order to first enter the cell and then enter the nucleus. So how does it do that? In uh, viruses that attack bacteria, as you saw before, there's code injection. The, the DNA or RNA of the virus is injected directly into the cell, and then it's run. Uh, and in animal viruses, uh, the viruses uh, fuse to the cell membrane, this wall around the cell, or they abuse a bunch of uh, cell entry mechanisms. Uh, they basically um, trick the cell into letting them in, like it lets in other uh, nutrients and stuff like that. Uh, the second part, as I said before, is entering the nucleus. Um, the viruses do that through uh, a bunch of mechanisms, but I wanted to cover two main ones here. I call the first one phishing because I thought it was very similar to the phishing that we know from, uh, from malware. It works by uh, exposing something called a nuclear localization sequence. It's a sequence uh, that is attached to proteins uh, that basically tells the cell to take this protein and everything else that is attached into it uh, into the nucleus. So uh, many viruses use this, this uh, mechanism, for example, HIV-1. Um, and in that way, they, they achieve privilege escalation by tricking the cell to, to, tell, to uh, basically tell, tell the cell, uh, let me into the nucleus and uh, let me replicate. <coughs> And uh, the, second, the second mechanism is physical exploits, um, which can be either entry during cell division, uh, because when the cells divide the um, wall around the nucleus, uh, sort of, um, it becomes looser. And so viruses can abuse that to uh, enter the nucleus during that time. And also, some viruses are so small that they, can, they don't have to abuse anything, really. They can just enter and tack through the uh, wall around the nucleus, and uh, the gaps there are, are bigger than them. So these are two ways viruses achieve privilege escalation to enter the nucleus. Um, now I'll talk about persistence. The two main mechanisms I want to cover here are latency and something called native proteins. Uh, latency is also similar to what we know from malware. Um, when viruses are latent, uh, they pr produce their uh, proteins slowly or they don't produce them at all. Um, some viruses uh, have a life cycle which contains a very active uh, virulent stage which causes disease, and then a latent stage which, uh, during which the viruses, you know, they, they uh, incorporate themselves into the DNA or RNA of the host, and they wait for some signal in order to uh, let themselves back out. And when they're back out, they continue the regular violent cycle of, of abusing the host machinery and then killing the host. Um, it's assumed that between 5 and 8 percent of the human genome contains uh, viral sequences of viruses that entered the genome at some point during evolution and due to mutations or whatever else became inactive and we have this uh, residue in our DNA. Uh, the second mechanism, native proteins, basically means that the virus can either steal or borrow uh, or encode by itself uh, proteins which are uh, used natively by the cell for various functions which um, mediate cell death mostly. Uh, so for example, uh, HIV has a protein called CD5-9 which uh, protects the cell from uh, being uh, killed by the immune system. So HIV produces this protein and puts it in the cell and in that way HIV can survive inside the cell and continue to uh, persist and replicate and the cell won't be killed. Uh, the next, uh, I want to cover now defense evasion, and this next mechanism, uh, mutations, I think it's the main defense mechanism used by viruses, and I think it's like the, the thing that makes them uh, unique. Um, it's also the most researched evasion mechanism in viruses. The thing that is unique about viruses is that their uh, rate of mutation is very, very fast. Um, and if they attack in large enough numbers, then they always have you know, a statistical chance of uh, several viruses having the right mutation and being able to uh, multiply and continue attacking uh, the cells while evading defenses against these cells, such as the immune system. Um, I want to cover shortly how a mutation happens. So what you have is you have your original DNA sequence there on the top that's contained inside the, uh, the virus. 
Um, and when the virus enters the cell and starts to replicate, then uh, the cell machinery, it has um, a sort of uh, rate of error which uh, changes between cell types and virus types. So during replication, this machinery can enter a few, you can look at it as errors or you can look at it as changes, however, however you want. So this machinery enters a few changes in the sequence, which are mutations. As you can see, uh, there was the original sequence and then there was a point mutation that changed the base T uh, to C. And then some of these mutations can be successful and uh, cause viruses to uh, evade the immune system. However, uh, many mutations are not successful and viruses or any, or any other organism, because all organisms have, have some rate of mutation. Um, if a mutation is unsuccessful, it can either be uh, sick and not reproduce or it can just die. Um, and in many experiments done on this, uh, we've seen that depending on the type of virus and depending on the experiment, um, the success rate of mutations in viruses is anything from one to 100 to uh, one in a million viruses succeeding after a mutation. But because viruses have uh, such a quick mutation rate and attack, attack in such large numbers, then it's very, very hard to, uh, it's very hard to protect, protect against that. Uh, two other uh, methods of defense evasion are obfuscation and packing. This is very similar, I think, to a packing and obfuscation in malware because in viruses, the code is, is inside the virus, the RNA or DNA, and it's only exposed uh, basically at runtime when it's either injected into the cell or fused and then enters it. So the cell and um, other defense mechanisms of the body can't access this code either to uh, read it or to destroy it until it enters the cell, and then it's just erased because the, the process of it is very, very quick. And also, viruses have a bunch of uh, very, very sophisticated anti-immune mechanisms, which I'm just going to talk shortly about because uh, they could, they could uh, have a whole talk for themselves. Um, basically, viruses can uh, mimic, modify, or repress immune messengers. Uh, the whole immune response is made up of a very long chain of reactions. So, sorry, if a virus is able to um, modify part of that chain, then it can redirect the reaction to attack a different pathogen or to not do anything at all. Uh, and viruses can also uh, actively repress immune system cells that attack them, cause them not to be produced or to just sit back and not do anything. Um, I think this is similar to uh, some uh, anti-AV mechanisms, but uh, in my opinion, these mechanisms are more uh, daring, I guess, and more sophisticated because they have a, a bunch of ways in which to attack the immune system and make it uh, stop working against them. I want to conclude by comparing a well-known malware and a well-known virus, uh, that's HIV and Duku2. So HIV is an RNA virus, it's uh, the virus that causes AIDS, uh, and the thing that it does that, that harms people is um, it, there's a gradual failure of the immune system. Uh, and Duku2 is a sophisticated phylos malware which was uncovered in uh, 2015, and it was used to spy on, on uh, many targets. So both of these, uh, the virus and the malware, they have methods of privilege escalation, persistence, and defense evasion. I'll cover each one of them. Um, for privilege escalation, both use uh, phishing. HIV-1 enters the cell through uh, the nuclear localization sequence I covered earlier. So it has, it has this, se this sequence that tells the machinery of the cell, take me into the uh, nucleus, uh, and I'll reproduce there. And Duku-2, um, as far as I know, the initial attack vector is assumed to be phishing. Uh, I'm guessing it was. I don't think it was uh, cover, uncovered 100%. Uh, persistence mechanism. So HIV-1, as I said before, it attacks cells of the immune system. These cells have a, a particularly long lifespan, and it attacks uh, different types of immune system cells, including memory cells. And these memory cells, since they have to uh, remember which pathogens attack the body, they have a very, very long lifespan, so it can sit in th inside these cells and persist. Uh, and Duku2 persisted through uh, the main servers in the network, which had a long uptime. And from there, it sent its implants to uh, all the other computers in the network, so, and it could, stay, it could stay up for a long time. And also, uh, both have uh, a bunch of defense evasion mechanisms, which I'm not going to cover each one of them, but I'll focus on mutations. Uh, HIV-1 has a very, very high mutation rate. Um, 
actually the mutation rate is so high that the only successful medication against HIV so far is a cocktail of, of several medications together because when each one of these is used separately, uh, the virus can mutate against it and make it ineffective. But because several, um, several different medications are used at once, and each one of them attacks a different part of the virus, then uh, the chances of success of the virus mutating against all three and attacking them are, are very, very low. And uh, thankfully, it hasn't happened so far. Um, and Duku2 also had a sort of a mutation mechanism. Uh, it had, for each new target, a unique combination of encryption and packing, which was uh, randomly chosen. But it was limited because it was hard-coded by the attackers. So even if there were, uh, I don't know, 30 packers and 30 encryption mechanisms, that's limited. While HIV-1 could have its mutation uh, at random anywhere in its code, it risked not being successful. But uh, through that, it had uh, much higher chances of success at, at evading the system. OK, to conclude. Um, while I was preparing this talk, I found that there were many similarities between uh, viruses and malware, and um, that it, it sort of surprised me. But I think that might be due to the fact that both ma malware and viruses, they have the same specific problem. They try to uh, infect a host and abuse it. Um, a difference, though, between viruses and malware is that viruses have been evolving and combating uh, their hosts for millions or even hundreds of millions of years, while malware uh, doesn't have such a long history, so we, we might be able to learn from that. And I think there are many things that we can learn, but two examples that, that I thought of uh, here are either uh, implementing a mutation mechanism in malware that has a more um, it's more statistical, meaning the mutations are more random and can be anywhere in the code. Um, so that's something that might be learned from viruses. And the second thing is like the virus uh, borrows or encodes host proteins for its own functions, if malware could infect the computer and then start uh, taking code off uh, processes also maybe at random in order to see if it can, if it can succeed in any way, uh, that's also something that might be learned from viruses. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, I hope you find this picture funny. I did. <laughs> uh, thanks. <laughs>